um, welcome everyone to Diversity Considerations in Dementia. How can we be inclusive of LGBTQ2+. Uh, Q2 plus? Um, so with us is Dr. Isabel Vidal. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Fis Family Medicine at McGill University, as well as, um, as, well as a public health physician. She's the co-founder and scientific director of the Pan-Canadian Research Team, research uh, on the organization of health services for Alzheimer's. Um, and then we have also Melanie Leder, also apologies if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, and she's a PhD candidate in rehabilitation science at Université de Montréal and a research assistant in the ROSA team. Um, that's the research uh, on organization of the healthcare services for Alzheimer's. Thank you so much for being with the, being with us here tonight, and I'm uh, super looking forward to this presentation. Thank you so much for this nice introduction, and you uh, pronounce very well our uh, names. I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> So um, we are extremely happy to be uh, with you tonight and to. Um, uh, do uh, to make a, a little presentation, but we will make sure to keep time to discuss with you uh, about uh, the experience and uh, how we can be more inclusive of a uh, person who are uh, LGBTQ2+. So I will uh, start to by showing you the, the, a little bit of the plan of our webinar. So I will first introduce our ROSA team um, and explain to you what are our objectives and who we are. Then I will show you uh, some of the current demand plans worldwide and in Canada. And then Melanie uh, will explain some essential concepts in LGBTQ2 plus research. And uh, she will uh, explain what she did, uh, very important work she did following the Canadian seven, seven uh, national objectives and how to make us uh, more inclusive. So I will start by uh, introducing our team. So it's really the research team on organization of healthcare services for Alzheimer. Why we pick this uh, name? It's because it's easy, both in French and in English, Rosa. It works, uh, it works for uh, French and English, but for sure we consider all type of person living with dementia, not only Alzheimer's, but all type of uh, person who have uh, dementia and their caregivers and uh, the clinicians uh, and social care providers uh, to them. So, what are our uh, team's general objective? Um, it's really to evaluate the implementation and the impact of uh, public policies, program, organization of health and social care services uh, for persons living with dementia. We work across uh, five uh, provinces in Canada, Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, Alberta and Saskatchewan, and we have a uh, a big international uh, component as well. We are really um, working on anything around diversity, inclusion, equity. It can be uh, rural care, how to be really uh, equitable uh, in rural communities. It can be uh, how to be equitable for persons with low socioeconomic status and also for uh, people who have uh, what we call them, I'm not sure, Melanie, we can call them sexual minorities, but uh, Melanie will explain all that uh, very soon. So make sure that the uh, gender identity and the, social, the sexual uh, preferences of people are respected uh, in dementia care. But beyond producing uh, very uh, strong uh, evidence, uh, what is really important in our team is that the evidence we produce have an impact uh, on person living with dementia. So we start to work uh, as fast as possible to give the results back to uh, the communities, to decision makers, managers, clinicians, person living with dementia, uh, care partners, caregivers. 
And to do that, uh, we assembled a big team of decision makers, managers, uh, clinicians, person living with dementia and caregivers. So we are 11 researchers, uh, very involved, uh, 50 researchers uh, in total, uh, many students, 22 students, uh, and research assistant, research associate, and we partner with person living with dementia. So we have a group of, um, and caregivers, we have a group of 16 person living with dementia and caregivers, care partners, who are involved in our team and they, as researchers, they are researchers with us and they help us make sure that uh, our projects are relevant, appropriate, and are answering important research questions. We also work with the Ministry of Health, uh, Dementia Advocacy Canada, the College of Family Physicians of Canada, to name a few. So why it's important to uh, discuss this topic uh, today? Um, we know that the WHO uh, asked the government that to develop national policies on dementia by uh, 2025. So it's pretty soon uh, that all government need to develop uh, a dementia plan. And usually this dementia plan, um, it's a comprehensive plan to address the needs of people with dementia and uh, on a range of issues such as promoting public health, uh, public awareness of dementia, improving the quality of healthcare, social care, long-term care, uh, support and services for people living with dementia and their families. So currently, uh, we, there are many, uh, next slide please, there are many uh, plans that have been developed or are in development. So the first plan, I look at the um, Alzheimer uh, International, the first plan was released in 2011 in Ireland. But in Canada, we were, I would say, um, at the edge of the curve, curve because we started in uh, 1999 with the Ontario Strategy for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia. Um, so Ontario was the first to, province to launch a dementia plan. In Quebec, the plan uh, was developed uh, in 2009. And there are additional plans that have been develop, developed uh, since then. So you can see that in Canada, we were really at the forefront of dementia plans. So our work, work to, today is, next slide please, is really um, embedded in uh, building a Canadian dementia strategy. So as you may know, in 2017, uh, the National Strategy for Alzheimer's Disease and Other Dementia Act uh, was uh, approved by the federal government. And uh, this uh, act asks the government to develop uh, a dementia uh, strategy for uh, Canada. Uh, we were um, an expert uh, on the panel um, developed by the Canadi put in place by the Canadian Academy of Health Science. Uh, you can see the, 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 the green report uh, in the middle of this slide. And uh, we provided the report uh, to the government of Canada to help the government develop their dementia strategy. And within this report, next slide, please. Uh, we were asked to um, develop uh, a synthesis of what is known about um, dementia and the LGBT communities, just to make sure that the, we, they have equitable access to care and their well-being is improved and so on. And there was other reports around equity, for instance, immigrants, uh, indigenous population, uh, rural communities. So you can have a look at this report because it's really uh, detailed and there is a lot of content. 
but today we will focus on um, dementia uh, and person uh, who are in LGBTQ plus, two plus community and Melanie will um, explain now what are the concepts around that. Yes, thank you. So let's start first by defining some of the most important concepts in diversity. First, the gender identity. So gender identity stems from your sense of self. So it is who you know you are, uh, how you think and feel about yourself and your gender. So some people identify as either a woman or a man, for example, but many can feel differently and gender identity might or might not reflect the sex that they were assigned at birth. People then communicate their uh, gender identity to the outside world through their gender expression. So how they present themselves to the world, how they dress, how they act, what name they use, etc. So it is common that people will identify as a man or a woman, but other possibilities also exist around these two poles, which we see under the brain here. And people can then express themselves in a variety of ways. As you know, there is not only one way to be a woman, for example. Now, sexual orientation is about who you are attracted to romantically, physically, and sexually. So if a man or a masculine or male person can fall in love with another man, but not with a woman or feminine or female person, he is likely a gay or homosexual person. Another example is if a, a man or masculine or male person can develop feelings and desire for a woman, but not for another man, he is likely a heterosexual person. So grossly uh, summarized, Gender identity is who you are, sex is what's in your pants, and sexual orientation is who you love. Now let's have a look at the acronym. The first three letters are about sexual orientation. So LGB stands for lesbian, gay, and bisexual. Lesbian refers to a woman or a female person possibly attracted to another woman. Gay is a synonym for homosexual, but it's commonly used for describing uh, a man or a male person possibly attracted to another man. Bisexual now refers to a possible attraction to multiple genders, so not limited to one category of person. The next letter is about gender identity. So the T in the LGBTQ2 plus acronym stands for trans which refers to a diverse group of people whose gender identity or expression diverts from the societal expectations. So it can be, for example, someone who identifies as a woman but was assigned male at birth based on their sex. Then the letter Q stands for queer, which is an umbrella term. It's often used to describe more um, generally various um, minority sexual orientation and gender. So it can also carry a political meaning, which is beyond the scope of our webinar today. But you can remember that queer is an umbrella term that can have multiple meanings. The number two in the acronym stands for two-spirit, which is also an umbrella term, but here it's specific to a Canadian First Nations culture. And finally, the plus sign. It, it is here to make more explicit the inclusion of others. So many more identities and orientation exist and they could have their letter in the acronym. So the plus here is to affirm the inclusion of all these people among the LGBTQ2 plus community. So now that we describe the concepts and define the letters, what is the overall situation for the LGBTQ2 plus communities in Canada? So first, let's travel back in time a bit and realize that homosexuality was criminal until 1969. Canadians could be sentenced to jail for it. It was then considered an, an official mental health diagnosis until 1973 in the whole America. 
but it was kept a bit after that in some places. And Alberta, for example, only removed it from their own list in 2010. Also, until the 90s, uh, police raids, violence and discrimination was common within the community. Uh, with the late, latest big raid, so police raid, officially in Montreal in 1990. So why is it important to cover these historical moments? Well, they, they could have a real impact on how the older adults live their lives. So in sociology, the term coming of age refers to the moment when a person enters adulthood and discovers who they are. And as such, events happening around that time will be important to consider to uh, fully understand where that person comes from. So to have a better idea, a person entering their 20s when homosexuality was a crime in Quebec and Canada would now have 72 years old. So just let's keep that in mind when discussing our next point. And after the 90s, the LGBTQ2 plus communities gained more rights and obtained more protection in Canada. The Prime Minister Justin Trudeau offered a formal apology in 2017 on behalf of the Canadian government and affirmed his support of the LGBTQ2 plus communities. This brings us to uh, today's situation and more precisely today's situation for older adults. How is it in Canada? A recent Pan-Canadian survey highlighted some gaps in awareness across the different provinces. Overall, 70% of Canadians knew about the meaning of the acronym LGBT, so the first four letters, with only tiny uh, differences across ages. Yet this number was uh, less than 50% in the province of Quebec. So this difference was not based on age, but more on province. The same observation was made for gender identity as overall 82% of Canadians knew about the term, whereas this number was only 60% in the province of Quebec. So definitely there is a need for more education, more resources, and this appears to be true across all ages, so no age difference here. Now, when asked if they knew at least one person openly LGBTQ2+, the age differences appeared. Two thirds of people under the age of 65 answer yes in Canada, with the province of Quebec showing even higher number. A very different portrait was seen for the older adults where the highest number were 25%. So this points out an increased risk for isolation and a more vulnerable support network. Also to keep in mind when we are gonna discuss our next points. Now, looking uh, from the dementia angle, if the current estimation are that 13% that of Canadians belong to the LGBTQ2 plus communities and the projected numbers of 1.1 uh, million for dementia in 30, 2038 are true, then it means that we can predict approximately 143,000 cases within the LGBTQ2 plus communities in about 15 years. With these high numbers and the current context, the government is now starting to take concrete action to assert Canada's stance on the inclusion of diversity. So the inclusion of the specific needs of the older LGBTQ2 plus communities in their new and national Alzheimer's strategy definitely goes in that direction. So this national Alzheimer's strategy that was introduced in the beginning includes seven priorities, which we will now explore in more details. So what we did with Dr. Vedel, we did a, a rapid search to identify those needs and then make some recommendation based on, on those priorities. So the first objective of the National Alzheimer's Strategy is developing specific national objectives. So Canada seems to be in some kind of momentum to initiate policy changes and to act as a federative movement to improve dementia care for Canadian older adults by opening up the discussion. Also, some local initiatives have been successful in the past few years, such as the creation of educational material for healthcare provider and long-term care institution residents in the, uh, the Maritimes. 
So their scale up to the whole country could be promising. And they surely are not alone in trying to improve care. So a pan-Canadian discussion would help to identify these innovations and good practices and then share them. The second objective of the national strategy is encouraging greater investment in research. This would be particularly important for our topic since research on LGBTQ2 plus older adults and their health is still limited due to first difficulties of including their identi identities in significant ways. However, efforts have been made over the past few years to gather more data and include them in health discussion. So for example, Statistics Canada started asking about sexual orientation in its official surveys in 2003. And in the most recent edition, also you might have seen the question pass. Going forward in this direction would help to obtain a more precise definition of the specific needs of LGBTQ2 uh, populations. The third objective of the national strategy is coordinating with international bodies. On that topic, the Alzheimer's Association from various countries are now starting to include the LGBTQ2 plus realities into their services. So some recently published material specifically addressed to these uh, persons, so LGBTQ2 plus persons living with dementia. And in these resources, they acknowledge their different lived experiences and the difference in their informal uh, support resources. They also referred to um, LGBTQ2 plus specific or friendly resources and they provided important advice such as recording important wishes in terms of pronouns and clothing preferences ahead of time. So a coordination of internal organization could be an additional asset for the national strategy. It kind of resonates with the first objective and goes even further by joining forces with other countries. The fourth objective of the national strategy is developing clinical diagnostic and treatment guidelines. Here, access to care is an important aspect. So it is already an issue for the general dementia population, but even more among the LGBTQ2 plus communities as the lack of trust in healthcare and the fear of being denied or provided with inferior care still remains a concern for the reason that we mentioned before. Additionally, the fear of disclosure can also create anxiety, especially with the reduced ability to manage sensitive information about themselves due to dementia. Patients might show memory loss to varying degrees and their reduced ability to remember who knows what definitely add some stress here. And with the number, the high number of service provider involved in their home support care, the coming out process to every professional coming at their house can be an additional source of anxiety. So to improve access and the care, experts advocate for education and training programs for the relevant healthcare professional and staff possibly targeting contacts with higher needs, so possibly those in more intimate contact. And a few programs and training kits for the inclusion of LGBTQ2 plus older adults in healthcare services already exist, such as well-being charter for uh, the residents, uh, printed guides, a tailored solution. However, when Going through the literature, we found no program specifically for LGBTQ2 plus older adults with dementia. So we would need then to refine existing training program to reflect the best practices. The fifth objective of the national strategy is assessing and disseminating best practices. So these best practices would ideally be person-centered and adapted to the context of care, whether the person is first living at home, in long-term care, or receiving end-of-life care. For the LGBTQ2 plus older adult living at home first, we need to take into account the potential specificities of their informal support resources. As we mentioned earlier, 
they are at a greater risk for social isolation than the general population. And many of them are still estranged from their families of origin. So as a result, their informal support is often provided by what we call chosen family members and partners. And this chosen family or even the partner, they might not have access to the same resources or even feel welcome to the same spaces than the other caregivers. It is important then to recognize the unique significance of those chosen families for LGBTQ2 older adults. Also, when entering the private space of home, special care should be taken to provide safe and supportive interaction in which patients feel comfortable to disclose their identities if and when they choose. Secondly, if we go more on the side of long-term care and nursing homes, a lot of LGBTQ2 plus older adults fear having to leave their home for a long-term care facility as they worry about discrimination and mistreatment. They are also worried as uh, going back to the closet. So this is especially, especially true for trans patients with dementia receiving intimate care. In response, some experts suggested developing specific LGBTQ2 plus long-term care spaces, but others prefer to keep the mainstream care yet with clear inclusive practices such as uh, professionals uh, collecting information in a sensitive manner, so providing inclusive option in the administrative paperwork, for example, not assuming the gender of the partner. Uh, also the use of unbiased language, so more uh, gender neutral communication, the respect of all pronouns, and finally the inclusion of LGBTQ2 plus educational material in general. So to achieve this, some say that involving LGBTQ2 plus representative within healthcare organization may be the way forward to make sure that this happens. And finally, for the end of life, LGBTQ2 plus patient and their caregiver express the, their need for the acknowledgement of their identity in the specific moment of end of life. They express how current resources could be more inclus inclusive. They describe such uh, specialized support group as they often found that their needs and identities were not included in the existing services. They didn't feel that they belonged to those spaces. The sixth objective of the national strategy is developing and disseminating information. We saw how uh, there were still important gaps in awareness right before, and the population we are describing tonight is at a very specific intersection. There are reports of age-based stigmatization within the LGBTQ2 plus communities where youth is particularly valued. And LGBTQ2 plus individual living with dementia reported experiencing this double stigma of dementia first and their sexuality, making it triple now with aging. So to overcome this situation, uh, maybe campaigns targeting both the LGBTQ2 plus communities and the general population could have a valuable impact. Finally, the seventh and last objective of the national strategy is making recommendations for standards of dementia care. Currently, no national guidelines have included these standards for a specific, that are specific to LGBTQ2 plus population with dementia. So Canada may be the 30th country to develop a national strategy for dementia care, as it was mentioned before, but will be the first to include formal diversity measures. And as the research in this field is still growing, this could be the first step in developing specific standards and accreditation procedures. And all these concerns that we discussed tonight, uh, so uh, aligned with the seven objectives, were explicitly included, as mentioned before, in the official Canadian Academy of Health Sciences report, where the commission a specific section on the topic. So you can also consult this 
report to have more detail on LGBTQ to older adults and dementia. And the discussion very specific that we did tonight is also available in more details in our 2020 commentary in the Canadian Family Physician Journal. So if you want to keep a paper trace, you can also go and read uh, this, this commentary. So now we would like to hear from you. If you have any comments to make or perspective to share, we are also open to your questions. I don't know if we see the questions. Yes, there's a box. So maybe you can stop sharing your oh, yes. one so we can see if... Uh... I think for those who wanna ask a question, you can raise your hand. It's on the bottom right of your screen. It's a little hand like this, um, or you can write in the chat box. So I don't see uh, who is uh, attending this session, but uh, we will be very interested if you have any question and uh, if you want to discuss, maybe there were some aspects that were not clear. Uh, it might be a bit uh, new concepts for you. Uh, uh, so no, do not hesitate. There is no uh, bad or good question. Uh, you know, uh, we love to discuss. Yes, or if you have something to share. Yes, so the paper, I can put the link in the chat, I think. So you mean the paper on the discussion or the, the report? So this one is the commentary that describes, okay, perfect. So this one is the commentary that describes the seven priorities. So really close to the discussion we had tonight. So it's an open uh, access journal, so you can have access to, to it uh, on the web uh, easily. And I would say that um, Oh, so the, the alphabet, you mean all the letters, is it? more clear now okay yeah yeah it's uh, it's complex uh, it's moving to understand and uh, yeah hmm. yeah so if you go and read that uh, commentary also you have uh, uh, like a, a, a glossary at the end so you can always go back and we go again to all of those letters one by one the one that are more, more known usually is uh, gay and lesbian or sometimes we call them homosexual uh, but in fact, slowly we understand a little bit the reality of persons who are uh, who have a specific uh, gender identity or a sexual orientation. So that's why the the number of letters is growing to really show the diversity of this community. But usually they share kind of the same stigma and the same challenges uh, in accessing uh, healthcare. 
So that's why that's why they. It's good to look at them. All the different aspects. Yes, particularly if you want to provide uh, care that is uh, holistic and takes account of the person as a whole. So that's why you, you have to consider what is the, the reality of this person. Yeah. Yes, it's sure that it's a delicate, uh, it's a sensitive topic because we are not used to talk about uh, if we feel that we are men or women or if you are attracted to men or women. Uh, usually it's a bit sensitive, so um, we, we are hesitant to talk about that. But uh, slowly it's good to start talking about that because for some people it's, um, it can be, um, if we want, for some people it can be a challenge to, uh, to be accepted as they are. So um, it's good to have some space where people can share if they want. I think we have a, a question in the Q&A. Yes, uh, anonymous question. So the question is, do you have any resources or actionable recommendation for home care or long-term care providers to make care more inclusive for LGBTQ2 plus people with dementia? So as we mentioned, the recommendation mostly apply to older adults that are part of the LGBTQ2 plus communities, but not specifically with dementia. So that's why the, the recommendation could be based on more uh, the needs that we found. But yeah, I would say the the elements that we mentioned before about the pronouns and how the administrative uh, papers uh, that we have to fill could be more gender neutral or could ask the question. So if it's just a, a box to check, that's rather quick, but for some people it could mean a lot. So, and just to, to make that is not very, it, it doesn't, needs a lot of money to do that. Ask questions and not assume. And not assume if someone is a widow, find some that the partner was a man or a woman and just ask, uh, oh, who was your partner, you know, and uh, those kind of things. And uh, so it helps people open up a little bit so what Melanie did uh, is really to do a literature review on the evidence and uh, what are the needs of the uh, LGBTQ plus, two plus community. But it's sure that the, the evidence on LGBTQ2 uh, plus and um, a person living with dementia is very small currently. So we try to develop this type of research to really understand what are the specific needs and how to address them and how to combine the identity of being LGBTQ2 plus and uh, with uh, living with dementia. But the, the, the evidence is um, still uh, sparse. So uh, that's why we needed to use some uh, evidence from um, older person rather than person living with dementia, older person in general. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure we'll have more evidence in the near future. Yes, and some uh, community organs, uh, some community resources that could be useful are not targeting dementia still, but older adults from the LGBTQ2 plus communities so you could go to, uh, it call, it's called the uh, Emergence, Fondation Emergence or Emergence Foundation. So they have some program to uh, train. So training kits for uh, many 
the worker. So is it office work? Is it uh, more uh, a research work? Uh, is it more uh, healthcare? So this could be a nice start. And I think they provide most of their services free. So that could be a, an interesting resource if you if you'd like to try this. I can put it here. So there is another question about how many people have you found that are dealing with both dementia and one of the sexual orientation. So um, we didn't inquire. Uh, we didn't do a prevalent study or, on uh, dementia and uh, sexual uh, orientation or uh, gender identity. But um, we can, as Melanie mentioned, it is estimated that 13% of people are from the LGBTQ2 plus community. So, so we expect that uh, among persons living with dementia, there are 13% of people, which is not small when you mm -hmm. think about that. 13% is a big number and it does not uh, receive the attention yet uh, that should be paid to this community because there are many of them. It doesn't mean that they um, are out, that they uh, they did their coming out and they told others that they, they are gay or lesbian or uh, because still some uh, do not want to share uh, their identity or their, but uh, we can expect that 13% of them, of people have, uh, are from the LGBTQ2 plus community. I have no uh, estimation of the number. The question is, do you know how many of the current population are out? The estimation were based on a um, confidential survey. So it's not the number about being disclosed to uh, other people is not something that I have with me right now. But if I can speak from a personal experience, I've met some people from the LGBTQ2 plus community that were just, um, that had moved to a long-term care facility and they, they were out, as you said, they, so they disclosed it and they had a very bad experience and they experienced some uh, bullying from the other residents based on that. So they were trying to move to another residence. So I would say that even, even if uh, it's easier in some places, it might not uh, translate to every setting, every context and particularly with other residents who are less aware, as we saw, it, it can be difficult uh, quickly. And some uh, people, as uh, Melanie mentioned, uh, decided when they move to long-term care, for instance, they do not disclose. They prefer not to disclose, even though they disclose their identity during their life before long-term care, huh, Melanie? Yes, another uh, older man I met was stressed about this because he he was he had mixed feeling. He was feeling sad about this idea of going. He called it back to the closet, but he felt that it was for his personal safety. He didn't want to be harassed and to be. Uh, bullied but then part of his pride was that he for a long part of his life was actively involved in activism and how to uh, um, um, militate for lgbtq2 plus rights so this was this came with sadness to him but he said that if he had to go one day to this long-term care facility 
he was sure that he would not disclose. So that's some kind of decision that he was thinking about. I think he published his uh, thoughts in the uh, La Presse. I, I could try to find it. It's in French, probably. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't speak English. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, it was so great to hear your insights and the research and, and your thoughts and the information. Um, so thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, and the whole um, session will be on YouTube after. So if you want to go back and um, listen again, you're welcome to. And um, you can always reach the Dementia Society at DementiaHelp.ca. Um, all right, I guess that's all for tonight.